the uh, subcommittee will come to order. Uh, for our second panel, our uh, uh, first witness is Ms. Catherine Allen, uh, the founder, chairman, and CEO of the Santa Fe Group, a strategic consulting company based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, the Santa Fe Group specializes in briefings to c levels and uh, boards of directors at financial institutions and other critical infrastructure companies and provides management for strategic uh, industry and, industri and institutional projects. And welcome to the subcommittee. Uh, and next we will hear from Mr. Mark uh, Rodenberg, the executive director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center uh, in Washington, D.C. He teaches information privacy law at Georgetown University Law Center and has testified before Congress on many issues, including access to information, uh, in encryption policy, consumer protection, computer security, and communications privacy. And welcome to you, Mr. Rodenberg. Our third witness is Mr. Donald J. Uh, Rebovich, uh, the executive director of Utica College's Center for Identity Management and Information Protection and executive director of Utica College's Economic Crime and Justice Studies Program. His background includes research in identity theft, economic crime victimization, uh, white-collar crime prosecution, and multi-jurisdictional task force development. Thank you for being here. Uh, next, we will hear from Ms. Ann Wallace, president of the Identity Theft Assistance Corporation, a nonprofit corporation that operates uh, ITAC, the Identity Theft Assistance Center. Ms. Wallace is a nationally recognized expert on privacy and financial services law, and she works to protect all consumers through consumer education and partners with law enforcement to combat identity theft. The final witness is Mr. Eric Handy, a representative for the Identity Theft Resource Center. Mr. Handy is an IT security and privacy specialist with over 15 years of information technology consulting experience. He specializes in privacy and information security program implementation and program management oversight. Uh, thank you all for appearing before the subcommittee today. And it is the policy of the subcommittee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I'd like to ask you to stand uh, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witness and witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make opening statements. Uh, your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. And the yellow light in front of you will indicate that it is time to sum up. Uh, the red light will indicate that your time has expired. Uh, Ms. Allen, we may begin with you. You, you can proceed. Turn on your microphone and pull it close to you. All right. Thank you, Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your leadership in highlighting the issue of victims of identity crime and the often long and lonely road they walk towards restoration. I have spent most of my career in the financial services industry, most recently as the founding CEO of BITS, a CEO-driven nonprofit financial services consortium. I also grew up in a small town in Missouri, and my dad was a banker, so I've grown up in the banking industry for a while. Today I'm involved in efforts to examine the way of the financial services industry is regulated and the impact of policy on consumers. In this area of identity theft, I believe we are just at the tip of the iceberg because of the growing cybersecurity threats we face. And it's why we think that a victim's bill of rights is necessary. The victim's voice is seldom heard in the debate. This testimony reflects the work of the Santa Fe Group Vendor Council, which was formed in 2006 to bring together leaders at service provider organizations. 
the Vendor Council promotes the development of secure best-in-class technology solutions, standards, and best practices related to fraud, payments, cybersecurity, data protection, and identity crime. Last fall, the Vendor Council formed an identity management working group to develop an inventory of best practices for assisting victims of identity crime and suggesting improvements in law and corporate practice to make it easier for victims to dispute false claims and reclaim their identity. My testimony today will speak to the Victims' Bill of Rights, um, uh, and it, the written testimony has many other background, much other background information. Identity crime victims deserve the same rights as other crime victims. Identity crimes can be physical, emotional, and financial, uh, and have those impacts compared to other crimes. Today, most identity crimes will be treated as misdemeanor, misdemeanors or very low-level felonies, and the majority of prosecutions will be civil as opposed to criminal actions. We need better coordination, awareness of the victim experience, and concrete steps for correcting identity records. For the benefits of individuals, business, and society, we propose the following Bill of Rights for identity crime victims, the right to assessment, the right to restoration, the right to freedom from harassment, the right to potential prosecution of the offenders, and the right to restitution. And I'll explain a, le uh, a little bit on each. In the right to assessment, consumers who suspect that they have become a victim of identity theft should have the right to assess the nature and extent of damage to their identi identity. FACTA already grants many of these rights, but there are sometimes procedural catch-22s. All businesses and government agencies should be required to provide notice to consumers when they suffer a data breach involving loss of sensitive personal information. But the present patchwork of state laws and government policy needs to be replaced with a uniform federal statute spelling out notification requirements. The right to restoration is ideally victims should be able to restore their identities to their previous pre-theft state. However, this is not always possible, especially with the complexity of the crime and especially with financial identity theft. Whether or not they can fully recover, it's imperative that victims be able to establish correct records and access all of those records in all kinds of institutions. Relevant privacy laws need to be reviewed and amended, giving victims the power to access and correct their own record. The right to freedom from harassment comes um, because sometimes collections agencies and others during and after the identity restoration process harass the individuals. The, con the harassment happens because business and law enforcement have no way to distinguish victims from the thieves. To combat this, some states have uh, issued identity theft passports to verify that the carrier has been a victim of identity theft and help the person prove his or her identity. However, these can be easily forged. So however effective the documents uh, <coughs> are, it remains to be seen, but some system for identifying and verifying victims is needed. The right to potential prosecution of offenders. One of the great frustrations to identity crime victims is the lack of business and law enforcement resources to prosecute identity theft. And again, there's always a need to balance priorities and budgets, but these organizations need to take the long view in the impact of identity crimes. First, that identity crime continues precisely because it pays. Second, the FBI and Secret Service have found that where there is one victim, there are usually more and need to look at this in an aggregate. And thirdly, not all of the costs of identity crime are immediately visible or measurable. The, uh, the right to restitution is where identity crime victims can spend hundreds of dollars and they deserve restitution, the same as victims of any other crime. Yet studies show that the defendants were ordered to pay in only about a third of the cases. Restitution will help make victims whole, send a message that to the end, uh, identity crime is a real crime, and helps ensure that when perpetrators are caught, identity crime does not uh, pay. To further help victims, the definition of comprehensible crime, compensable crime, under federal and state statutes should be expanded to include identity crimes. In summary, I'm recommending three things in terms of possible legislative actions and then four other things. First, to enact a uniform scheme across industry and government to identify identity theft, to assist identity theft victims, and that's to include the five items included in the Identity Theft Victims Bill of Rights. Secondly, to create a national standard of identity 
identification, one that cannot be forged by identity thieves that victims can use to dis distinguish themselves. Third is to expand the definition of comp com compensation compensable, can't say it, crime, under federal and state law to a, a include identity crime. Four other things are to invest in independent research on the effects of identity crime. We need to get beyond the annex anecdotes to understand the actual relationship between data breaches and identity theft and to be able to understand what policies and law enforcement procedures are effective. Secondly, there need to be standard dispute procedures in industry and law enforcement where upon resolution victims could receive standardized verifiable letters proving the issues have been resolved. Third is the FTC does a terrific job in overseeing victims' rights, but it could be expanded, and perhaps the role to make sure that there's cohesiveness across national laws uh, to be more effective and to also make sure that law enforcement is investigating it identity crime in a consistent way. Lastly, uh, there's much discussion, uh, especially after today's announcement, on a consumer financial protection agency. In that dialogue, uh, the idea of identity theft policies and education should be concluded. We thank you for this opportunity to, to present, and again, if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Rottenberg, you recognized for five minutes. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on this very important issue uh, for American consumers. Uh, my organization, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, has been working on the issue of identity theft almost since our founding 15 years ago. In fact, I was going to uh, mention to Mr. Driehaus that um, one of our first cases concerned the privacy of the social security numbers of employees in the state of o Ohio. Uh, and we uh, succeeded in that case. They limited uh, the uh, use of the, the publication of the SSNs, but as you know, that continues uh, to be a very serious problem. Um, my comments today are directed toward what we see as the root causes. On the first panel, uh, you heard from the FTC. They talked about how they're assisting uh, the victims of identity theft after uh, they run into problems. The Department of Justice is prosecuting the crime after the crime occurs. Uh, but in our opinion, not enough is being done to address the root causes of the identity theft uh, uh, problem. And so in, in my statement, which I will briefly summarize now, I'm going to try to speak to that issue and suggest specifically uh, for this committee some steps that you might take uh, to reduce the problem of identity theft in this country. Uh, because as you know, not only is it a significant problem, in fact, the number one concern of American consumers, according to the Federal Trade Commission, it's a growing problem. That number's been increasing since the FTC has been keeping track of it. And it's an evolving problem, which is to say I think we're about to experience uh, new forms of identity theft. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, for example, reported just this week about an identity theft investigation in Los Angeles involving improper use of medical record information. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about that as more of our personal medical information is digitized and, and made available online. And so in just a few minutes, I'd like to address what I see as at least five steps I believe the committee could take to try to reduce the problem at, at its source. Um, one of the concerns today, I believe, should be the increasing uh, transfer of information within the government onto the Internet. Uh, you've already heard about people getting access to public record information that contains social security numbers and bank account numbers. Well, there's a big push right now in the federal government to take advantage of some of the new Web 2.0 services. And we certainly support the president's call to make public information more widely accessible to the public. But we think that privacy protection has to be part of that process. Privacy issues have not been given enough attention so far in this new push to make federal information available online. We hope more can be done. We think there are similar concerns with respect to the outsourcing of government services. A lot of personal data is moved from government agencies to private contractors. And it's not always clear if those contractors are subject to Privacy Act obligations or other contractual obligations to protect the personal information of the U.S. citizens 
that they now have obtained. And you may recall, in fact, uh, Mr. Chairman, last year in the run-up to the presidential election, there was the case over at the State Department involving the passport records of then-Senator Obama and Senator Clinton and Senator McCain that were all improperly accessed uh, by private contractors. Uh, that is closely tied to the problem of identity theft, and we believe it's an issue that this uh, committee could look at. Uh, privacy legislation is a very important part of the way to get to the root cause of the problem. It is simply too easy today uh, for companies to collect a lot of detailed information about Americans. They have too few responsibilities, and it's too difficult, I believe, for Americans to protect their information once they've turned it over to a, to a bank or, or to some other firm. What privacy legislation will do is put some obligations on those companies to ensure better security, better safeguards. It will also, I hope, get some of those companies to think about whether it's such a good idea, for example, to collect social security numbers, which we know will be the target for identity thieves who are trying to get access to that information. If fewer organizations in this country were collecting the social security number and using the social security number, we think the problem of identity theft would go down. We'd also like to see more emphasis on privacy protection in the administration's focus on cybersecurity. There's a lot of talk right now about strengthening the nation's infrastructure. Part of that has to be about the protection of personal information that's being stored on computers and servers in the United States. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to raise one issue. It's a little bit futuristic, but at the same time, we believe it goes to the heart of the problem, and it's going to be with us for some time. We think Americans need better tools for identity management. And by that, I mean we need better ways for people to interact with government, for people to interact with businesses without being required to disclose so much personal information or to give up a number that links together all their personal information. That's the essential problem with the social security number. It links together too much data. We think new tools for identity management could help address that problem as well. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Rebovich, Rebovich, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Clay. Members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the serious crime of identity theft the impact that it has on its victims, and what can be learned from criminological research in this area. The research center I direct, Center for Identity Management and Information Protection, is housed at Utica College in Central New York and is a research collaborative dedicated to the prevention and containment of identity theft. While the term identity theft is familiar to many, questions still remain regarding what the term really represents. What type of person is most likely to commit this offense? What criminal methods are most commonly used? Thank you. And who's in most jeopardy to be victimized? As a criminologist, I believe that answering these questions brings us many steps closer to help to lower the incidence of this insidious crime and protect the interests of those who, fit, who fall victim to it. Now, my center undertook a uh, challenging research endeavor with empirical analysis of over 500 U.S. Secret Service identity theft cases. And we studied it for a period of, uh, well, it's covered over a period of six years. When the results were released, they were met with an interesting mix of curiosity and surprise. Contrary to some earlier victim surveys, this study found that many victims did not know their offenders. The median loss for a case was found to be over $30,000, much more than the average estimates drawn from victim surveys. A full one-third of the offenders were found to have committed their crimes at their place of employment spotlighting the special problems of unscrupulous insiders who would use personal information for criminal purposes. Individuals were not the only victims. The financial services industry was victimized in 37 percent of the cases. In 21 percent of the cases, the victims were retail businesses. The financial services industry was most frequently victimized by offenders using fraudulently obtained personally, personal identifying information to obtain new credit card accounts to apply for and obtain fraudulent loans, to pass checks, and to transfer funds. The retail industry was victimized by the use of stolen identity information to open store accounts and by purchasing merchandise with fraudulent credit cards. Uh, as a criminologist, the study 
findings impressed upon me the stark realities of identity theft in our modern society. Many of the crimes were carried, carried out easily, and it really didn't take, in many cases, us analyzing that because some of the offenders in case notes indicated and bragged about how easy it was. A common characteristics of, 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 this, of these offenses is that these criminals are criminal opportunists. They look for the path of least resistance, and they find it. And there are many compromise points in our system that they can use to commit these offenses. In the final analysis, the identity theft would take the path of least resistance toward the ultimate goal of using someone's identity to commit fraud in, the, in someone else's name. But there are a series of vulnerabilities, system vulnerabilities, that we can address to try to cut off the blood flow to these offenders. For instance, merchant recognition of counterfeit cards. Time and again, the actual cases indicated a failure of merchants to detect that credit cards were not authentic. Bank oversight of new account creation, a failure of bank personnel to recognize false identification information. Oversight of employee access to customer client information, another failure of an employer to effectively monitor employee use of customer client personal information. Credit card issuers oversight of adding users to existing accounts, a failure of issuers to effectively verify authenticity and victim approval of requests to add offenders, add offenders to existing accounts as credit card users. Government recognition of altered forms, another failure a failure of government agencies to detect false documentation leading to fraudulent misuse of documents and victims' names. And finally, the oversight of employee access to client customer credit cards, skimming. Another failure of employers to effectively monitor employee use of credit cards in the course of legitimate credit card transactions. Uh, now just to summarize in terms of what we can do with this information to help the plight of victims. I have distilled my recommendations and my testimony to three optimized protections. Optimized authentication protection, optimized protection of personal information, and optimized protection by law, law enforcement. In authentication protection, we need to have the best tools possible and standardize them to make sure we can authenticate who these people are, whether they are actually the people they say they are or criminal offenders. Optimized protection of personal information. We're talking about all the different agent sector and public sector that have access to personal information and house it. It's their responsibility to protect that information. And finally, optimized protection by law enforcement. Half of the cases that we looked at that were Secret Service cases started at the local level with local police officers. These were people, these were officers who did the right thing. They understood what identity theft is and they reacted. Other research, unfortunately, has shown that's not always the case. What we need to do is address these authentication, um, optimized protections to try to close the gap to prevent identity theft. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Wallace, you recognized for five minutes. Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for inviting me today and for giving you the opportunity to tell you about ITAC, the Identity Theft Assistance Center. Six years ago, executives of the largest financial services companies in the country got together and realized that while they were doing a great job helping their customers at the time, there was more they could do to help their customers who became victims of identity theft. One of the key problems that victims face is that the criminal uses their information in more than one place. And the victim then has to find all of the places where the frauds occurred, tell their story again and again, and prove who they are. It's a very time-consuming law enforcement. Um, identity crime frequently involves jurisdictional lines, and this kind of fragmentation really makes it difficult to investigate and prosecute these crimes. So in 2003, under the leadership of the Financial Services Roundtable and BITS, 50 of the largest financial services companies came together to form ITAC, a nonprofit organization committed to helping victims recover from identity theft, partnering with law enforcement to catch and convict the criminals, and to consumer education. Since 2004, ITAC has helped more than 55,000 consumers recover from identity theft. The service is free to the consumer 
and is paid for by the financial services company. Very briefly, here's how the service works. It starts at an individual member company who helps the victim resolve any of the problems at that company. The company then directly transfers the consumer's telephone call to an ITEC agent who walks the consumer through their credit report to find any other cases where fraud may have occurred. If fraud is found at other places, ITAC notifies all of those companies, whether they're ITAC members or not. The ITAC members get instant notice from us, online notice. The other companies all get a letter from us saying, this person is a victim. You need to do something about it to fix this problem. Um, now, as you can imagine, this is a very rewarding job um, I have. I mean, it, it is wonderful to be in a position to help people at a time when they need it most. And that's exactly what ITAC is. It is a helping hand at a time when people need that help most of all. Just one quick example. Um, one of the people we helped was a 71-year-old man from California. He was a tax preparer who, out of the generous kindness of his heart, rented an apartment in his home to a woman and her daughters, treated her like a daughter. She used his computer, stole his financial information. He didn't find out about it until he got a bill in the mail for a credit card that he had never applied for. When he came to ITAC, the ITAC agent found one other account, fraudulent account in his name, and five other attempts to open accounts in his name. What he said to the ITAC agent was, you can't imagine what a relief it is in the middle of all of this having somebody who is on your side. So it, this is a terrific service, and people really appreciate it. But I want to turn quickly to law enforcement, because that's another key area that we operate in. We share data with both the Postal Inspection Financial Crimes Database and with the Federal Trade Commission's Consumer Sentinel Database. And this information is used by inspectors and, and law enforcement all over the country. The reason this is so important is because instead of each company sharing information individually, we have data from multiple companies, from national, it's national in scope, and it's in a consistent format. And law enforcement tells us that they're using it very effectively. Um, in, a, in a number of cases around the country, it's helped them crack the cases. The third element of our mission is education. We work very closely with the Federal Trade Commission. We helped when they launched their Deter, Detect, Defend campaign. And we also have a terrific website of our own, identitytheftassistance.org, to help on this consumer education effort. So in summary, I would say that a lot of progress has been made over the last six years that I've been head of ITAC. We've had great new laws passed, more consumer education, and a much better response on the part of law enforcement, but there is certainly a lot more to be done. Um, consumers still have difficulty filing police reports in many jurisdictions. Um, there are still gaps in the, the enforcement efforts, and the lack of comprehensive data makes it difficult for policymakers such as, your, such as this committee to, to make the best kind of legislative choices. Um, in closing, what I would say is that we believe that the ITAC model a collaborative private sector approach that is focused on best practices and most importantly focused on helping the consumer recover from this crime has great potential in other industry sectors and for government agencies. So thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you Ms. Wallace for your testimony. Mr. Handy. You Good afternoon have five Chairman, minutes. Chairman Clay and subcommittee members. My name is Eric Handy, and I'm here to represent the Identity Theft Resource Center, ITRC for short, um, here for the founder, Linda Foley, and they're based in San Diego, California. Uh, very similar to ITAC is that we are also a free service for victims. Uh, we deal quite a bit with victims, as a matter of fact. We also deal quite a bit with legislation, government, uh, law enforcement training, just general awareness training in a lot of areas. Uh, going forward, um, we also have a nice survey such as it's called Identity Theft, The Aftermath. This year's version is Identity Theft, The Aftermath 2008, of course. There, you can really hear the voice of the victim call out to you when you read those statements from actual victims. And that's the one beauty of the ITRC is that we get to deal from the victim from start to finish in a lot of cases. And we get to work through all the system and all the quirks in the system, and we get to find out what doesn't work and what does work. Um, and, and you can read that document and, and very clearly uh, see 
uh, over the last six years how things have changed. And what I want to really emphasize with the, with the little time that we have now is maybe three areas, emerging areas. I know we asked that question in the last panel that we see that is happening out in the identity theft world right now. Number one is child identity theft is something that's increasing. Number two is medical identity theft, which has been elaborated on already. And number, uh, number, number three is uh, identity theft in the deceased, believe it or not. So this is a real cradle to grave situation here where the, most, the average person is usually aged 26 to 34 that's affected by identity theft. But it can happen at any point in time, as we, you alluded to earlier. When, you, when we talk about child identity theft, I just read a statistic today before I came here and that if you took every classroom in the United States, you'll probably find one child identity theft and victim in that class. And that seems like an awful lot to me. I know we can play around with numbers and statistics, but it is a big problem. Because a lot of cases, the creditor or the person offering the opening the credit account does not know the age of the person or the social security number. Because the social security number is associated by date of issue, not, not birth date. So there's an issue there. So they really don't know if, they, if the person's a minor or not. So they more, most likely will allow the account to exist. And that causes what we have here, the child identity theft problem. A solution that we, we offer up is to create a database. We call it the 17-10 database. What that is, a database that has everybody's, uh, everybody from one day old to 17 years and one month included in this database. This will be done through the SSA, Social Security Administration. This has been talked about, potentially. Uh, it's been banded about a little bit. Uh, so it is possible. And they would keep that database, and everyone who's giving credit would have that, the ability to check that database based on Social Security numbers in, in six weeks order. Uh, and you would check that to make sure that person's not a minor. That would automatically, in a lot of cases, eliminate some of this child identity theft problem. Issue number two, medical identity theft. Okay, we all know uh, the presidential uh, movement is for 2014 for all medical records to be online. And that's quite daunting. Being in the profession of IT security, uh, that concerns me a little bit. That always concerns me because 95% of the, our medical information is being held actually by the small provider who is least likely or least able to, to protect themselves because of resources. So it's already a, a predicament already, but when we put everything online, it's more easy for the thieves to get, so we must make sure it's secure, obviously. Uh, we've all seen the stories or heard the stories, at least I have, of the persons who got the medical bill for the foot amputation and they never had an amputation and no one believed them. When they called the creditors, they didn't believe them. They ever make jokes about it. The person has to go to the office, the billing office, and show them that they have both their feet. That's, that's where sometimes where this leads to with some of the victims. Now, unfortunately, we, have, we deal with the victims, so I get all these fantastic stories about these things that happen. But that's where we're at sometimes. No one believes the victim. So we're here to be the voice of the victim um, currently, uh, right now. So there's a lot of procedures that are usually in place, but they're just not always followed or enforced. And that's why you have the situation that I just mentioned where you, you bring the bill and you, and you show them you haven't got the foot in the table, and they still probably don't always believe you 100%, believe it or not. <laughs> so, so that's where we're at in a lot of cases when it comes to medical identity theft. We have the identity theft red flag rules that's going to help out with the medical identity theft uh, coming up in the future. And um, what we do need is more privacy laws. For instance, if someone stole my medical identity and I found out about it and I corrected it, and say I had diabetes, and then now it shows I don't have diabetes, well, that's a problem already health-wise. But I can't go back and change that to diabetes because I can't see my records anymore because the imposter has the right. So something's wrong with that story there. I no longer have rights to my own medical record to make the change that I need to correct it. Now, there is some solutions to that, make a, a, a alias, uh, a card where it shows that there has been a, a, a mishap that occurred and that you can track it. So that one problem is if we do clear that record totally up and then they come back and strike again, it will, it, you could be hit over and over again. So we do need some kind of record on that. Lastly, very quickly, identity theft and deceased, as we know, even when, even when people die, unfortunately, that's the best people to get for identity theft because they're not able to watch themselves, obviously, or kids. So that's the perfect situation. In a kid's case, you have 18 years to operate as identity thief. Beautiful situation, that's what, that's what you're into doing. Uh, so we must stop that from happening. As far as identity theft, the problem that we have with deceased is that when the death certificates go out through federal agencies, they must all be tracked properly and, and notified. 
a lot of these solutions have been uh, drawn up in, in our testimony for further, for, further, for further reference. Lastly, in the world of identity theft, today is tomorrow. In other words, the thieves are way ahead. So we got to stay ahead of the thieves. We have to stay one step ahead. This is like riding a Bronco, but don't know where it's going. Uh, and we need more enforcement. I know we talked earlier, we need more enforcement. On the bottom lines, there's no enforcement, so people don't really care to protect these, 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 uh, these um, situations. Um, and uh, thanks a lot for your time, and look forward to answering questions. Thank, Thank you so much, Mr. Handy, for your testimony. Thank all of you. Let me start the questioning uh, with Ms. Allen. Uh, Ms. Allen, will the, the move to electronic medical records bring with it an increase in medical identity theft, and, and why? Why is that? Uh, I, I believe it will, because you're <clears throat> aggregating data and making it easier for the criminals to attack it. Now, I think it's a good thing. I'm not opposed to this happening, but any time you make it easier in a way to uh, uh, create a larger database, it makes it more attractive to thieves. And the thieves are going to be interested in it. You don't have insurance and want to have insurance to cover some procedure in a hospital. It may be, uh, be that they want to get access to prescriptions for uh, drugs that, um, uh, and, and that's a big issue of uh, having the data for or, um, legit, legitimate drugs, but drugs that they may be after. Um, and then uh, the third part of it is that um, they will be looking to scam the system, the, whether it's the Medicare system, Medicaid, or the, uh, the hospital systems. And there's a lot of money flowing right now without um, that it would be very easy if you have a false ID to be able to access. It, all of this can be prevented if it's uh, when they're developing the um, procedures and the requirements for the medical databases to make sure there's adequate security, that there's layers of security, and the technology uh, that will help to uh, limit the access to that data that will make sure that only those that, that, have, um, the, uh, that are enabled or should be uh, have access to it can have access to it. But it's going to bring security problems. Uh, Mr. Roddenberg, uh, Mr. Handy, addressed an issue that that is a mystery I guess to to lawmakers here you know how do we rectify um, that person's medical record that has been stolen so that they can get back to it to correct it when the imposter uh, in accordance with with our laws has now has rights to that medical record that the imposter stole uh, how do we how do we fix that well uh Sir, I'd need to look a little bit more closely at the relevant regulation. I know a lot of the agencies right now are working to implement uh, the privacy law that was recently signed, the, the High Tech Act. Uh, but my instinct uh, would be that there's going to be some entity out there, maybe it's the hospital, maybe it's the insurer, but somebody's got that record. And who's ever got that record has the responsibility to ensure that it's accurate. I don't think they get to say to the actual patient, oh, we're terribly sorry, there's been some confusion here, you're going to have to sort it out. It's actually the organization that has the record that has to sort it out. So I think what you'll need to do is put some new incentives on those organizations that have the record to say, listen, there's a problem here, and you're the ones who are best able to fix it. Babich, any thoughts on, on the imposters? On, okay. Okay. Uh, let me let me ask you, Miss Miss Allen. Um, why do you feel a federal preemption law on privacy is better than those in individual states? Well, I, I think that we have a, a complex system of state laws, and it makes it more expensive for any business. And and as was just mentioned 95 percent of healthcare providers are small businesses or small practitioners it becomes almost impossible for a small business to understand what the privacy laws are in each state and therefore they sometimes don't pay attention to it so if you had one federal law it would be much easier to make people aware of it it would be uh, consistent it would be more cost effective, it would be better for consumers because they would understand what their rights were in each state. And there's some excellent laws out there. There's a new Massachusetts law that is, uh, uh, might be a model for 
one of the other issues here, it has to be on all businesses, not just financial services companies, but because all businesses have sensitive data, either about their employees or their customers. Mr. And so it needs to be something yeah, that goes across. Mr. Rodmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to speak briefly to this issue because it's one that the people in the privacy community feel very strongly about. Um, and I'd just like to say I think it would be a tragic mistake uh, to have federal preemption of, of privacy law, uh, specifically in the area of identity theft. Because one of the things that we've observed over the last several years is that the state legislatures, which are close to this problem, are coming up with new solutions to try to respond as they uncover new problems. The federal law is a very good baseline, but in California, for example, they just recently amended their identity theft law to deal with this problem of medical identity theft because they were now experiencing a new problem. And if they had been preempted, prevented from doing that, mm -hmm. I think many more people would have been, uh, you know, suffering as, as a consequence. I see. Uh, Ms. Allen, you, uh, you recommend the government conduct more research in this area of identity theft. Could you be more specific? And, and how would you propose uh, more standardized approaches to uh, Well, again, I think public procedures. funding. I'm sorry. Uh, public funding uh, available, and it could be administered through the FTC or the DOJ or whatever the appropriate agency. But first of all, to really track the um, correlation between data breaches and actual incidences of identity theft, because it is growing. I mean, there, there's arguments on both sides that you can have data breaches of millions of records, but only a few turn into identity theft. I would argue many of these uh, organized criminals are holding that data. And the last time I testified before you, uh, the CIO from the state of Missouri talked about apprehending a criminal who had stolen records from the University of Missouri, and they were going to hold it for 10 years. That's strategic planning. So I think we have to look at the correlation between data breaches and incidences of, of identity theft and track that over time. I think we have to look at what policies and procedures that are already in place, including legislation, and how effective is it. Uh, and a good example of that is the credit reports or credit freezes and track over time how effective that is. It's This is... I've mentioned we're on the tip of an iceberg, and I come from the cybersecurity perceive, and I think it's going to blow open um, uh, what's happening out there in terms of the access to data from cybersecurity uh, breaches. And we need to be ready and prepared to help the victims and have the layers of security. But we're, we're, we have a war coming. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rebovich, uh, what do you propose to bring um, the treatment of identity theft victims in line with the way the criminal justice system treats victims of other types of crime. Hmm. Frankly, I think we're behind. Turn on your, your mic for me. Okay. Frankly, I, th I think we're behind uh, in doing this as a, as a society. Um, the treatment of identity theft victims, I would say, is, I, I would sort of call them the, the second second level of seriousness um, where it should be a higher level of seriousness that, the, that we address. In other words, um, even though it's not a physical assault, it is an assault upon the finances of the people who are victimized. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that actually the term identity theft has become sanitized to the point where we're accepting it as sort of, yeah, it's a part of life. Well, I think we have to change. We think we have to, to, to change our perspective as a system, a criminal justice system especially. Um, we wouldn't, if, if there was a victim of domestic violence, for instance, as a society, we would make sure that that person who's been victimized gets all of the possible uh, help that they can to recover. Right now, we're not doing that. We're not doing that with identity theft victims. I'm not saying that it's not, uh, the particular crime is on the same level as a violent crime, but I think we have to treat it with more seriousness. And, and usually it's, it's a, um, a financial harm is committed, so we need to first repair the financial damage that occurs and, and, and any other damage. Uh, yeah, the financial, I, I'd say the financial harm can be very serious. It could also lead to psychological harm and emotional harm. Okay. And that's something that I think um, criminal justice 
research has not really tracked very effectively. What's the long-lasting harm that it brings to people who are victimized? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wallace, the I Identity Theft Assistance Corporation has unique data sharing agreements with several government agencies and private industries that are used in its mission uh, in the investigation and prosecution of identity crime. Can you share this uniqueness with the committee at this time? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I mentioned very briefly in my testimony, today um, and for years, individual companies have shared information about their own experiences with law enforcement. And they'll work on individual crimes. But to do the best possible job today, as, the, as some of the other witnesses have said, this is cyber crime. It may involve multiple witnesses across multiple jurisdictional lines. So you really have to have federal, state, and local enforcement agencies working together and data from multiple sources. That's been the key to success of the regional identity theft task forces. For example, there's a, there's a great task force in St. Louis that has a, has a great record of bringing together um, St. Louis County and the district attorney's office and uh, FBI and Secret Service to work on a collective basis. So when they have information from various jurisdictions about multiple victims across these jurisdictional lines, they can do a far more effective job in using their very limited resources to, to catch the, the criminals. Uh, how, do, how do we get um, better procedural help in the resolution of cases? How, how do we establish better clearance procedures and national databases for criminal identity theft victims? Is a bill of rights the answer? Well, I would say, Mr. Chairman, um, the law enforcement community has already done the foundation for data sharing on a federal level, and I'll be happy to respond in more detail in writing with more information about some of the great projects um, that we work with okay. to share information among federal and state law enforcement. And I'm sure the Federal Trade Commission would be happy to provide more information about how their consumer sentinel database is used by about 1,400 law enforcement agencies around the country at the state, local, and federal level. So the foundation is there, but certainly more training, uh, more funding, and, and frankly, more encouragement to, you know, to, to do this kind of partnering would be very welcome. Thank you. Mr. Handy, the uh, uh, H.R. 2221, the Data Accountability and Trust Act, was introduced in the House by Chairman Bobby Rush of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Uh, the ITRC has been involved in monitoring the legislation as well as working with those that have been aggrieved by thefts. What are your thoughts on this legislation? Does it go far enough? And please elaborate. Okay. Uh, our recommendation is that it, it probably does not go far enough when it comes to identity theft regulations. Um, uh, that the bill itself, um, it's um, trying to trying to remember when we discussed that exact bill. But when it comes to identity theft, we felt that there should be a general ruling, and then you should give each state a specific uh, the opportunity to to go further based on the situation. Okay. And that was the, that, that was our standpoint on that bill. So we wanted a general general sentencing, but you wanted the ability to add more based on the situation that was at hand. Thank you. Mr. Rodenberg, um, can you comment on the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and its ability to adequately cover identity theft victims, and where does your organization uh, fit in this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm actually not, um, not familiar with that legislation, so I don't think I'd have a comment on that. I did um, testify on Mr. Rush's bill, and I think that is good uh, legislation. I think it would uh, help reduce some of the problems related to identity theft. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And, and uh, what policy changes can enhance the support of future research on, on identity theft and its victim, and what specific areas do you see as warrant, warranting future research? 
Well, I think the statistics are very useful. I think the information that the FTC has been collecting over the years has given us a clearer picture of the problem and some of the trends uh, that we need to be aware of. So we certainly support that. Um, I think it would be helpful anticipating some of the new types of problems that are about to emerge to expand uh, some of the data collection, looking at medical identity theft, for example, and also some of the identity theft related to new online services. Uh, I think the information is very, very helpful. Ms. Uh, Ms. Allen, what, what more can be done by the technology community uh, to mitigate identity theft, and what responsibility do they have? Uh, this gets back to the issue of cybersecurity breaches and um, the application software or software providers or operating systems that have great vulnerabilities and some kind of both accountability or perhaps liability on the technology community to, to be partners with the user community in closing those vulnerabilities or finding patches that will work more quickly or staying ahead of uh, some of the cyber security thieves. The way it is right now, the user community is pretty much uh, has the total responsibility and accountability. I see. As a, as a final question to the entire panel, uh, give me your thoughts on what more can be done to educate the public and law enforcement about helping the victims of these crimes. And we'll start with you, Ms. Allen. And okay. I think showing the link between cybersecurity breaches and identity theft uh, will be very important. And as we have a cybersecurity czar in the White House, having that be part of the mandate. And then secondly, in the dialogue around a consumer protection, financial uh, protection agency, having uh, identity theft and cybersecurity threats being part of that dialogue. Okay. Mr. Rodenberg, any I think telling people about the very good resources at the Federal Trade Commission as well as the resources that are provided by some of the organizations represented on this panel will help consumers. But I do, Mr. Chairman, believe very strongly that in this area there's only so much the consumers can do. I, I really think we're going to need to get to the root of some of these problems about uh, computer security, use of the Social Security okay. number, and that will have to happen in Congress. Okay. Mr. Uh, I think that... Uh, we have to attack the problem from several different areas at once. And uh, in terms of the education of the average citizen uh, to prevent victimization, we've got to understand, we, we can't forget that cybersecurity is very important. Uh, many more people are on the Internet now than ever before. But we can't overlook the fact that many of these cases are low-tech cases as well. People can be victimized from not shredding personal material. They can be victimized because they don't have a, a lockbox on their mailbox. Uh, many of these offenders that we researched in our study used very low-tech methods. They didn't have to go any further. The opportunities were there. So in terms of educating the average citizen, I think we have to educate the average citizen on awareness on how to protect themselves on the internet and use of computers, but also not forget they have to be certain every day that they're doing everything they can to prevent victimization by the use of low-tech methods. Thank you. Ms. Wallace? Um, I would agree with um, most of the comments made by the other panelists. That is, the, the complex nature of identity theft makes education extremely difficult because there are so many kinds of risks and it can happen in so many different ways. Having said that, um, I'm particularly excited about a, an initiative that we will be launching later this summer which is focused on youth, um, which I think is an area that, uh, an audience that perhaps has not been brought into this debate as much as they need to be. And it's a, so it's a program to, to help the youth who are online and Facebook and YouTube and lots of other places understand the, that there are risks indeed in, in, that, in that environment. Okay. Mr. From, Hand. from a consumer standpoint, I think we need awareness, more awareness training uh, and reaching out to the public. Uh, for instance, t teaching people how to read credit reports, teaching people how, what they're supposed to do on a yearly basis so you can catch it. My theory is it's going to happen. It's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. So let's protect people and prepare them for what can happen and how to, how to defend themselves. And I think we can at least cut down the loss. If you catch it early, it's not that bad of an issue. 
but if you don't, it, it, it drags on. From a business standpoint, I like what the federal government's done with FISMA, the scorecards, put some accountability to a lot of people, and it, it seems to work to some degree where people will move and make better, and we need to do that in the business world. I, uh, I want to thank you. I'm, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. I find this subject to be uh, uh, one of urgency. Uh, I find it to also be fascinating uh, that in this day and age, uh, we haven't really figured out uh, how to police this issue. And, and as a government, we need to get on top of this and stay on top of it. Uh, and, and so I appreciate all of your testimony today and the first panel's testimony. Uh, and I'm sure that, that this will not be the last of, of hearings like this on this subject matter, but it, it is now time for us to act uh, as an institution, as a legislative body, uh, to come up with sound uh, law based on, on some of the advice that you have brought us today. Uh, we have been joined by... Uh, Ms. Watson of California, uh, and, and really, we were really wrapping up, but if you have anything you want to contribute at this time, you may. Uh, Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm always pleased to come to your committee. We were invited over to the Senate to meet with Senator Reed, and uh, by the time I got there, uh, the meeting had been canceled. But I do know that uh, the issues that we wanted to raise, uh, I've been told that most of the questions have been addressed. Yeah. So I just want to thank you. Sorry to be so late to catch you at the end. But do know that I'm absolutely interested in the subject matter. And, thank uh, you. And we hope to hear more. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, this subcommittee hearing stands adjourned.